This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. is sufficient to meet the need of the hour. 
And one of the reasons why I think that we should look critically at the curriculum and at all that we've inherited is that there is evidence that amongst those who are passionate about history, it's still the case that what they're being fed is thin gruel intellectually. Um, many of you may be aware of the survey that was recently carried out by Professor Derek Matthews at Cardiff University. You'll be aware that Cardiff is a, uh, a very strong university, one of the Russell Group universities. Um, Professor Matthew conducted a, a quiz, <coughs> uh, a series of questions which were asked of undergraduates who were reading history at that university. So these are people, by definition, who would have um, an A and two Bs at A level. And because they've chosen to read history, one would expect that it's almost certain that one of those A-levels would be in history, and very probably they would have secured an A. So they're among the, uh, the, certainly, the historical elite in our schools, and they're certainly people who, if they're prepared to spend three years of their young lives studying history, people who are either passionate or curious about the subject. Now, when he um, asked them these questions, he asked uh, who was the British general in charge of Waterloo, who was the monarch during the uh, uh, assault Spanish Armada? What was Isambard Kingdom Brunel's profession? Could they name a single 19th century Prime Minister? And could they say where the Boer War took place? Now, the survey found, bear in mind that these are history undergraduates, that only about one question in five was answered correctly. Almost twice as many students thought that Nelson was in charge of the Battle of Waterloo as named the Iron Duke, while there were nine students who thought it was Napoleon. <laughs> One of them spelt it Napoleon, N-A-P-O-L-I-A-N, and another, even more imaginatively, N-A-P-O-L-I-U-N. Ninety percent of the students could not name a single British Prime Minister from the 19th century. So it's not just that they couldn't name Spencer Percival, Derby, Rosemary. They couldn't name Disraeli, Gladstone, or Peel. And um, Professor Matthews, who conducted the survey, emphasised that 85% uh, of his undergraduates age group would have known even less than these students, because by definition these were among the 15% of students who had been best taught and best stretched in history. And bear in mind that uh, even though the number of students who've been taking A-level history has seen a welcome uptick, it's from a base which is lower than many of us would wish. And it's also the case that the number of pupils taking history GCSE has fallen overall by 8% since 1995. Now, I'm someone who would like to see a bigger market share for history, uh, for all the reasons that David has outlined. And I think if we are going to ensure that more history is taught, it's not enough simply to say that it might be a good thing to make it compulsory to 60. That's a debate that's uh, open at the moment, and it's one on which I have a totally open mind. But one of the things I'm concerned about is that if you make something compulsory, in a way, you ignore the broader question, which is, why aren't more students opting of their own free will to study history? And why is it that academics like Professor Matthews fear that even those who have opted enter university without the, uh, the breadth of historical knowledge, which he believes is appropriate for someone embarking on undergraduate study? Now, I have to agree with David that if you look overall at what's written in the national curriculum, then it seems reassuring. But the truth is that what's written in the national curriculum is not actually often what is taught in our classrooms. And it's not just in history, to be fair to David. It's also the case in English literature, for example. At last year's Conservative Party conference, I suggested that it might be a good idea if more students were to read Dryden or Pope. They might think that's a slightly highfalutin aspiration these days. Um, and I accept that it was romantic uh, to uh, hope that these classical authors um, might be more widely read. But what no one at the time noticed, none of the commentators who criticised me, or those who rode in behind me, what none of them noted is that Dryden and Pope are both in the English national curriculum with the expectation that they will be taught at key stage four to those aged 14 to 16. But how many classrooms have you been into recently 
where people are working their way through the Dunciad, or Absalom and Achitophel? Not many. And that's because the national curriculum is often as honored in the breach as in the observance. And it is also the case that the national curriculum, exactly as David says, well, it does provide a prospect of a varied and stretching menu, is often twisted out of shape because of the requirements of the exam boards <coughs> and assessment. And we know that one of the problems that we have um, in English education is that the assessment tail too often wags the curriculum dog. And if we look at what happens in our GCSEs, we see a picture which I don't think is satisfactory. Now, before I embark on wholesale change and reform to GCSEs and the curriculum, I want the historical community, in particular teachers, to let me know if they think that I'm being unfair or if I've got hold of the wrong end of the stick. But I want to begin by saying that I think that there are problems with what we examine and the way we examine history um, in our schools. Um, there are basically, as I'm sure everyone here is familiar um, with, two types of history GCSE. 40% uh, of pupils opt for the school's history project type of history GCSE. Um, now, one of the things about the school's history project is that there are a range of choices um, in, in different papers. But I asked to see what the figures were for which papers were chosen, which tells you what's really taught in our classrooms. And what's striking is that of those 40% uh, of people who opt for the school's history project, only 8% of them are studying British history. 4% choose to study um, uh, Elizabethan England. 4% choose Britain 1815 to 1851. But 48% study the American West in the 19th century. And 44% study Germany, 1919 to 1945. So 92% of those studying that half broadly of the history GCSE um, don't study British history. They may touch on British historical events um, through uh, another paper, which takes a theme through time, whether it's medicine or media. But almost by definition, if you're studying medicine through time or media through time, there will be significant events and trends and moments in British history that will completely pass you by. Um, the, uh, there is another exam board um, which offers uh, the school's history project as well. I mentioned AQA's figures there, and there's Edexcel. With Edexcel, only 4% of pupils study Britain at all. Again, the overwhelming majority, 96, study either Germany in the run-up to uh, the Second World War or the Wild West. 60% of Edexcel students study the Nazis, 36% cowboys and Indians. Um, and again, the... Um, uh, uh, the impact of um, British history in other parts of the GCSE curriculum is tiny. Um, medicine and treatment, again, through the ages, is taken by 76% of pupils, um, but there's very, very little uh, room for any other British history at that point. Um, the other half of students who take GCSE history take um, uh, the modern world syllabus. Um, and what that means is even though there are a range of options there, um, which examine what happened in the run-up to the First World War, the run-up to the Second World War. Um, there is no pre-20th century history at all. And of those pupils who were taking a depth study uh, unit, i.e. You know, really concentrating on a particular area, um, once again, 20th century Germany was the clear preference. 59% of pupils taking Edexcel's exam studied the Nazis, and 54% taking OCR. So what we see there is the evidence for the oft-repeated assertion that school history is all Hitler and the Henrys. But the truth is that actually there's very little concentration on any of the Henrys, quite a lot of concentration on Hitler, um, and also a surprising and under-remarked enthusiasm for the American West, 1840 to 1895. Um, now, I think that such a concentration amongst so many students <coughs> on the history of America over one 50-year period and Germany over one 30-year period is clearly wrong. We need to ensure that our GCSEs and our national curriculum are better aligned 
and critically for better align so that our students have a better understanding of the linear narrative of British history and Britain's impact on the world and the world's impact on Britain. Um, and I think that we need that greater degree of knowledge because of the explicit value that I attach to history as a way of ensuring that uh, today's young people are prepared for their duties as citizens. I know that there are passionate debates in history about whether or not we should concentrate on uh, the imparting of knowledge or the cultivation of skills. And there are equally furious debates about whether or not history can be used to pass on values, like pride in this nation and a sense of citizenship, or whether history can be taught entirely neutrally, much like, say, physics or geography, as a set of principles divorced from how we live as citizens. Um, I don't believe that it's possible for any politician to take an absolutist position in either of those debates. It would be quite wrong. But I do believe that it's important that we emphasize that without knowledge, the cultivation of skills is exceptionally difficult. And without a clear sense of chronology and development and causation in English history, it is particularly difficult to cultivate the skills necessary. Because one of the skills that I would like to see <coughs> students develop is the capacity to interrogate arguments, to separate uh, the false and the foolish, the meretricious and the mischievous from the true, the honest, and the principled. And of course you develop that through uh, looking at primary sources and seeing how they've been interpreted over time. But it's also the case that those values themselves of critical inquiry, that belief in the free exchange of view, is itself a fruit of the development of our institutions and our culture. If you believe in critical inquiry, then you can't help but be influenced by Milton and Locke. If you believe that a democracy is all the better for contending points of view, where there is never any single truth that prevails over time, then you're inevitably influenced by what's happened in this country over time, as there's been a struggle between rival views of how we should be governed. So anyone who is ignorant of the glorious revolution, who's unaware of what happened at Runnymede, who doesn't know why the Great Reform Bill is so named, I think has been cut off from those events and those arguments that sustain and nourish our open and democratic society. Now, of course, it's perfectly possible to take different views of those events. It's perfectly possible to say that King John was traduced. It's perfectly possible to say that the Glorious Revolution was not really that glorious over, uh, after all, and it was merely a Whig oligarchy <coughs> maintaining its privileges by kicking out someone who believed in toleration for Catholics and dissenters and was actually a much more radical figure than uh, uh, Whig history has allowed him to be portrayed. It's vital that those debates occur <coughs> in the academy. And it's vital that students are given the tools to be able to engage in those debates in the classroom themselves. But unless there is a proper grounding in knowledge and chronology, unless there's proper familiarity with the actors, unless there's a proper sense and appreciation of the struggle between the powerful and the powerless, between the executive and the individual over time, then I think that people will find themselves in current political debates deprived of the inheritance that they should be uh, perfectly entitled to um, and which enables them to play an appropriate and fulfilled and mature part in those debates. I suppose you could argue that in a way I'm being utilitarian or instrumentalist. I'm basically saying that history is a better form of citizenship. I want to walk away slightly from that interpretation. I recognize that history is so much more. Learning of any kind is a good in itself. Historical study is exciting, engaging, creative, fun. The best history teaching, done by the best history teachers, needs no justification. It stands in its own right. But when we're making an argument in the 21st century for the importance of academic inquiry, and critically, 
or am I making an argument for history and believing as I believe that it should have a bigger and a more privileged place in our classrooms, then it's vitally important that we state that we value history because history tells us something about our own values and that you cannot understand why it is that it is so important that we're taught about the past and taught how to interrogate the past unless you realize that in the past, previous politicians and previous British citizens fought for liberty of thought and of expression. I don't believe that is a narrowly Whig interpretation of history. I think it is a broad, generous, and liberal approach towards a subject which I love and I would like, dearly like, so many other young people to grow up loving. Thank you all very much. Thank you.